Well, then we have here this holy marriage. I do the first and congratulate to Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Thomas Hughes, who began their life as, uh, wedded together in Christ today. And we read here the epistle for the Mass of the wedding, uh, taken from St. Paul's of the Ephesians, chapter 5. Brethren, let wives be subject to their husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the, the, head of the church being himself Savior of the body. But just as the church is subject to Christ, so also that wives be to their husbands in all things. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church, and delivered himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, cleansing her in the bath of water by means of the word, in order that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. And having spot and, and, and having not, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that she might be holy and without blemish. Even thus ought husbands also to love their wives as their own bodies. Even he who loves his own wife loves himself. For no man ever, no one ever hated his own flesh. On the contrary, he nourishes and cherishes it, as Christ also does the church because we are members of his body, made from his flesh and from his bones. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, I mean in reference to Christ and to the church. However, that each one of you love also love his wife just as he loves himself, and let the wife respect her husband. I'm going to stand for the gospel. Taking that according to St. Matthew, Chapter 19. At that time there came to Jesus some Pharisees testing him and saying, it is, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for any cause? But he answered and said to him, Have you not read the, that the Creator from the beginning made, made them male and female and said to, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh? Therefore now they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, that no man put asunder. So words of today's holy gospel. And the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, Amen. When God created man, He said. Let us make man according to our own image and likeness. He made an entire world that is very beautiful. There is beauty in the stars, beauty on the earth, and all things that God created are good. But then he said, let us make man unto our own image and likeness. And therefore he took the slime of the earth, and he breathed into it and created Adam, who was made from the dust, made from the humus, hence the word humility. He is made from the dust. And then he told Adam, he gave him a test. And this is the test before the test. We read later on, we read later on, that God would test Adam and Eve. But before he tested Adam and Eve, he gave a test before the test. And this was, he told Adam, I am giving you a responsibility. Go out into this beautiful world that I created, which I have made for you. I made this world for you. Now go out into this world and see its beauty. Go out into this world and name the animals. Go out into this world and take care of the garden and be the ruler of the earth. All of it is yours. And this was the test before the test. Adam went out. And he saw all the animals. And they were beautiful and good. And he saw the clouds. And all the stars. And they were beautiful and good. And everything was for him. And he came back to God. Now what is this first test? Oftentimes when you make something... Before you put it out on the road, you test drive it. I made this car to be able to drive 100 miles an hour and to stop in 25 feet. So you test it. 
Then you put it on the market. God did not test any other creature. He knew that they were perfect and good. But with Adam, he decided to give him a test. And Adam didn't even know that he was being tested. Go out and name the animals. I have said to the Father and the Son and Holy Ghost, we have spoken to one another and we have said, let us make man in our own image and unto our likeness. Is man really like me? Is man really a reflection of God? More than angels who are better, more beautiful than men? More than animals? More than all the beautiful things that I have created, says God? Is he really like unto me that I'm going to attest? Adam have made all these things for you. Isn't that wonderful? He got the greatest Christmas present. He got everything. And he came back to God. What did he say? Lord, I really appreciate all the things you've given to me. But I have no creature like unto myself. He wanted something more. Let us make man into our image and likeness. If he's really like me, he will have infinite desires Give him a million dollars. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a millionaire. All right, you got all the money in the world. It's in a bank account, an Excel spreadsheet. You got it all. You own everything. More than George Soros. More than Bill Bates. Will Gates. We should be in the Bates Motel. But nonetheless, more than them. You own more than everybody. Is it enough? If he is of me. If he's of God, he will come back and say, I really appreciate this infinite universe. It's really big, but it's not enough. I want more. Is he really like unto God? Then he wants more. And secondly, the test. God testing his own creation. I want a creature like unto myself. If he's like me, he won't just want more. He won't just want everything. He won't just want infinite desires. But he will want even more than that. He will want to make more. He will want things to grow. He will want things to increase. He will want to take all the knowledge that's in his mind that God just gave him in his most perfect mind. He will want to take all the love that's in his heart that is a most wonderful heart, the heart of Adam. And he wants that heart to spread the love and to spread the truth, and to share it, to take that love where there is not human love, to take that knowledge where there is not human knowledge. The animals are wonderful, but they don't have the knowledge of God. And all the creatures are wonderful, and they are beautiful, and they reflect God, but they don't have the love of God in their own hearts. They're the expression of love, but they don't have love, and they don't love and therefore, the first history of man is that he came to God and he complained. This is before the fall. So wives should not be disturbed that their husbands complain. But nonetheless, he complained before the fall. And it was a holy complaint and one that made God most happy. He is like me. He wants more than just this universe. He wants more than just all the beautiful things I made for him. He appreciates it, but he wants more. He is like me. And he wants to share himself. He's not satisfied to own all the things on earth. He's not satisfied to be the richest man in the world, the most intelligent man in the world, the wisest man in every way, the one with the greatest heart, the most brave. He is the most wonderful of all men, Adam is. And he's not satisfied. And all the sons of Adam must know this. We are the sons of Adam. And one of the tragedies of the 20th and 21st century is that we try to be satisfied with too little. We're not much smarter than Judas. As Bishop Sheen used to say, the trouble with Judas is not that he betrayed Christ, but he betrayed him too cheap. He sold the Son of God for only 30 pieces of silver. How many priests have sold their priesthood for only a few years of pleasure? 
How many men have sold all their birthright before God for a few years of sin? The trouble is not that we have sold God. We sold him too cheap. God made us to desire more. More than all the things that he created in this universe. And he created Adam. And he wanted to see Adam. Adam, are you a real man? Because if you're a real man, you will be like me. I am perfectly happy in eternity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We don't need anything else. But we want it more. Therefore, out of absolutely nothing, we made an infinitely large universe and an infinite number of beautiful things because that's what God does. Are you a real man? Did I really make you a man? Then if you are a man, come back and show me that you are a man. And Adam did. He came back to God and he said, I want more. And I want to share what is in my mind outside of my mind. I want to share what's in my heart outside of my heart. And that's what makes a man a man. We must understand that love is a manly thing. Love is that which proceeds from a man's heart. And if a man does not pour love out, then there is no love in the world. Remember what our Lord Jesus Christ said. Greater love than this, no human being has. No one has, male or female. Except this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. It's the most beautiful thing for a girl to lay down her life. It's most wonderful. So many of our martyrs and saints have done that. But there is no greater thing than a man that lays down his life. If it was great for a woman to lay down her life, then the Blessed Virgin Mary would have laid hers down. No, she united her heart to his and she helped him lay down his life. And that's what a good wife is supposed to do. And men should remember that when their wives nag them to death. The good wife helps her husband die. And that is exactly what the Blessed Virgin Mary did. She prepared her son for death. And she stood by while he died. Then why is she the greatest of all the wives? St. Augustine says, when you consider what happens upon the Holy Cross, it is nuptials, it is marriage. For there is a most sacred union between the man and the Holy Mother Church. And what is going to happen in this marriage bed of suffering, says St. Augustine, there will come children, there will come life, we have a world that is tragic today because there are no men in it. Now when God created woman, that most beautiful creature called, Thy kingdom come. How did Jesus Christ say those words the first time he taught us that prayer? When you speak to the Father, you say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth. Just like it is in heaven. That's how he taught us to pray. And we repeat those words in every mass. You hear the priest sing, Pater Noster, Quies in Celis. No one says it with him. Only the priest. Because every time you go to mass and you hear the Pater Noster sung or said by the priest... You're learning again, and you're learning again, and we're learning again, and again and again. That most holy prayer which must enter into our being. It must be the center of a holy marriage. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. We have to desire it. We want the entire world to be Catholic. The entire world to know, love, and serve God. We want the Holy Father to know, love, and serve God. Because he doesn't know him. He doesn't love him. He doesn't serve him right now. But we need him to know, love, and serve God. And obey the Blessed Virgin Mary. And consecrate Russia to the Mac heart of Mary. And one day he shall receive the grace to do that. 
And we want all of those in Russia and all of those in every part of the world to know, love, and serve God that the kingdom may come to every planet, to every city, to every nation, to every family, and every individual person upon this planet. We want the kingdom to come. And we want His will to be done. Where? On earth. Right here in this chapel. Right here in this family. Right here in this seminary. Right here in all this land of America. In this entire planet. We want it to be done on earth like it is done in heaven. And part of that being done is to increase and multiply. To desire with all our hearts to increase and multiply. But this can't come unless we die. For unless the seed dies, says our Lord Jesus Christ, it remaineth itself alone. That's the most tragic thing. How many millions of souls today are living alone? Alone in their houses, alone in their apartments. Having a TV to make noise for them and a cell phone to keep them busy. And they are alone. It is not good for man to be alone. What about those hermits? Are they alone? Absolutely not. St. Mary Magdalene was the most wonderful of the hermits. Every day, she would climb in, the, in an ecstasy up into heaven, and she would commune with all the angels. The angels are by the billions. They outnumber men. She spoke with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then she would come down to earth and go to sleep. She didn't have time for other people. Because she spent her whole time in the community of heaven. The hermits are not alone. They are with God and with the angels and with the saints. It is not good for man to be alone. Who is the most lonely man on earth? It's quite simple. The man that is in mortal sin. The man that does not have faith. The man that does not know, love, and serve God. That is the most alone man in the world. And we want to remove this loneliness. We want it to be taken away, for it is not good for man to be alone. And if we do know, love, and serve God, we want to spread that love. We priests of the Holy Roman Church, we're not allowed to marry girls. Why is that? We got better girl. <laughs> we don't need a girl of this world. <laughs> we have our Holy Mother of the Church. We have the Blessed Virgin Mary. And we are meant to be fathers. And what is a father? He is one that increases and multiplies. He's one that brings the knowledge and love of God to where God is not. And so we have so many more children. So many more children than a father of a family. But it is fathers that are needed to solve the problems of the world today. We need fathers. Fathers that are men and fathers that love. And when father with love goes through the world, Satan is defeated. Satan is terrified. The Holy Father in Rome, Francis, he doesn't understand the power of the love that is inside of his heart. If only he can take that priestly heart and turn it to his priesthood. If only he can take the fatherhood of his papacy, he is called Papa. Why do we call him Papa? It is a familiar word of those who are the closest to us in fatherhood. He is called Papa. And what is it that makes a papa a papa? That he loves his children. That he does the good for his children because he loves them. And one day he shall receive the grace to obey our Holy Mother in Heaven and consecrate Russia and take care of his children and hand over the faith to them. This is what a papa must do. He is the Holy Father. And our trouble today is there aren't Holy Fathers. Let us pray for the Holy Father in Rome that he become a true father again. And the fathers of dioceses, who are the bishops of the church, and the fathers of uh, parishes, and the fathers of families, that they learn what love is and carry love into a loveless world. Our world is without love because it does not have men that are carrying love inside of them. It doesn't have men that are ready to die. Greater love than this no man hath, no one hath, than that a man lay down his life for his friends. And when our Lord Jesus Christ went to lay down his life, you apostles will follow me. You will also become martyrs. But not today. Today I go. Today I die. And a real man wants to die alone. Alone in death. 
united with all others in life. Let us have the heart to be real fathers. We need fathers. This is most necessary. And then from the side of Adam came that most beautiful creature called Eve. And she is simply called the mother of all the living. Let's have a holy marriage. God bless you in this marriage. And also that all Catholic marriages must remember you're united in Christ. A most wonderful union, like in the union between Christ and His church. Let this be the marriage union of everyone that is married. And remember, let the husbands be Christ and seen as Christ by their wives. Let the wives be the church and seen as the church by the husbands. And then we'll bring back peace and order to our world. Those are bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. And also, during the Mass, during the Canon of the Mass, we have the ancient nuptial blessing. But on the day of the marriage, uh, Tommy is not blessed. Only the Christian is blessed on the day of the marriage. All blessings pass through the bride. Remembering many things, one of course, of course, is that Adam was not blessed and not, did not feel happiness until Eve was created from his side. And also, our Lord Jesus Christ died in the greatest of sorrow. And he experienced only joy when the church came into being and children were born in our holy church. Hence, there will be no blessings given to Mr. Thomas, none will be given to him yet, no none are on the list of the things to do today. The blessings all pass through the bride. And in the Mass, the Canon of the Mass, we turn to the Canon of the Mass to do the nuptial blessing of the Old Testament of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or of, of Rebecca and uh, Rachel and Sarah upon the bride in the Canon of the Mass. At the end of the Mass, a second nuptial blessing. We will turn around and the couples will be, the couple will be kneeling for those two nuptial blessings. And then, uh, and then the conclusion of the Mass.